Welcome back to the Lutheran History Podcast, where we examine old stories of the Christian faith as it has taken place in the Lutheran Church. We are continuing one of our more popular uh, mini-series here on the Lutheran History Podcast, Little Details Less Often Told. Maybe I butchered that a little bit. Details Less Often Told, I think, is is how you, you, you go through it with Pastor Nathaniel Biebert. Today, I'm willing to bet that unless you read a recent uh, article in the Wells Ford and Christ magazine that most of our audience maybe have never heard of this, or if they have just kind of the, a footnote in history. We're going to talk about Lutherans burned in Brussels today. Uh, before we get too far into it, uh, thank you, Pastor Biebert, for joining us once again. My pleasure. It's been a while. Nice to be back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so this is our 500th Reformation anniversary for uh, at least this this year. This was July 1st is the date, right, in, in 1523, and you'll tell us all, all the details now. But first, uh, how did you get started on this specific topic of all the Reformation history? Why did you narrow in on this one? Yeah, um, part of it was just that, um, you know, there weren't a, there weren't a ton of um, memorable events uh, in, in 1523 in Luther's own life. Um, he was obviously doing things. He was obviously very busy, um, but not any any standout stuff that that makes for you know just a fantastic story. Um, and then secondly, in reading about Luther and reading Luther biographies, if you read enough Luther biographies, you eventually do get something told about these first Lutheran martyrs and and Luther's reaction to hearing about them and how he ends up, as we'll talk about, writing his first hymn um, to commemorate their memory. Um, but I, it just seemed like it was a story that there was more to it, uh, than what was, than what was usually told just from kind of Luther's perspective off in Wittenberg miles and miles away. Um, and so I, I wanted to find, I wanted to find more information on it. I wanted to learn more about it myself. Um, and I would say, um, apart from the circuit paper that I ended up writing to cover, cover it in the detail I wanted uh, it to be covered for myself. Uh, I would say really there's only been one other book that I borrowed heavily from um, in writing that paper that has been written really with that topic as its focus. It really is kind of a slide underneath the scenes and, and behind the scenes uh, type of event. And um, who doesn't... It, I don't know if this gets to some sort of uh, sinful fascination with other people's pain or something like that, but who doesn't love a good martyr story where people are are willing to die not for a false cause um, or or a questionable cause like the kamikazes in World War II or something like that, but for for the eternal truth of God? Um, so that was that was what piqued my interest and caused me to dive into it more deeply. Yeah, I think you asked a good question, and it was rhetorical. Who doesn't love a good good martyr story? But I'm also thinking, you know, I kind of wonder across um, Lutheran circles how much um, is martyrdom something that's even frequently brought up? You know, when when do you really get a chance in your your average Christian's life to talk about um, anyone after Stephen? Really, in the book Book of Acts, there's a long centuries uh, of history of Christian martyrdom, but I don't know if how often we, we talk about that or think about that. Um, even yeah, much... If we talk about other extra biblical martyrs, they're usually, you know, in the first few centuries of the church. Um, and, and that's what we always go back to. And we don't, we don't usually even ask the question, well, have there been Lutherans, you know, since the Reformation who have been put to death for their faith? So yeah, that, that adds more curiosity for modern day Christians who happen to be in the Lutheran church. Um, yeah. it, it ties to us. Absolutely. So it goes into my next question. And so why should we know and care about this event 500 years uh, apart from a morbid fascination is yeah. <laughs> trying to avoid? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, here's 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 an example of Christians who didn't just die for um, the gospel in a general way, but here's Christians who died for the gospel in more recent history after the gospel was restored to prominence and, and sort of purified of its of all of the uh, foreign elements that had gotten washed in with it over the years. Um, and and two, these two men who stood up and, and said, yeah, we're, we're willing to go to the flames and burn slowly to death or quickly to death, whatever the case, but either way, painfully, um, we're willing to burn to death for this because it's, it's that important. Um, 
And so, yeah, I mean, it's it's easy in a country, and this maybe it gets a little bit more to the practical application that we'll talk more about at the end. But it's easy in a country uh, where we have religious freedom to and and churches can become something where it's like, well, do I feel like going to church this week, or do we have other stuff going on this weekend? Um, it's easy to take it for granted uh, what we hear and what we are able to participate in every single week. Um, but do we realize that what we have is actually a treasure worth dying for? Um, so I, I feel like that's why this this account is really something that's beneficial for us to study and and take away from. Yeah, well said. So getting into the content of your research, this topic, uh, your, your paper and article, um, the whole context, at least as far as the organization is concerned, obviously the Roman Catholic Church in the late medieval era is there, but there are a lot of moving parts and pieces to that. And this is maybe the, the touch point where people who are generally familiar with the Luther story can maybe plug in to the narrative. Um, that's the smaller organization within the Roman Catholic Church called the Augustinian Order. Yeah, what can you tell us about that event, or at least, or that organization, I should say? At least, what should we know uh, for today's topic? Yeah, um, so I'm not remembering off the top of my head when the Order of Hermits of Saint Augustine was founded. Um, Something in my mind is telling me 1200s, but I don't know if that's uh, an accurate thing in my mind. But I do know that um, there was already a movement in the late 1300s um, for sort of a reformation, if you will, a uh, reformation of the Augustinian movement. And it was called the um, the, the name of the movement, the more formal name for the movement was called observance or the observant movement. Um, and the idea was that by that time, um, people had gotten kind of lax, not just in the Augustinian order, but in other orders as well, had gotten lax in following the rules of the order. And there were all sorts of exceptions and dispensations that were being made for following this or that rule. And so it kind of was getting to the point where even monks themselves were asking, well, why why follow this order if we're not going to follow the order? Um and so there was a movement that began in the second half of the 1300s and really gained strength in the late 1300s and into the early 1400s of uh, this observant movement where there were movements within all of these orders to um, get back get back to the original rule and to follow it diligently and seriously and to make this a truly um, a truly pious and and serious and diligent and faithful way of life. Um, instead of just looking for an opportunity to join a club that was outside of society and then and then go and live as you want there, uh, which is an over exaggeration of what the others were like, but you get the idea. Um, and so that that observant movement was actually the the movement into which um, when Luther himself ended up joining the monastery, the Augustinian monastery in Erfurt. Um, that was it was an observant monastery that he joined. It wasn't just your run of the mill uh, or conventual, as they were called. It wasn't a conventual Augustinian monastery. It was an observant Augustinian monastery, um, which was that um, that uh, branch of the Augustinian order was headed by Johann Staupitz at the time, who was actually only the second um, vicar general of the observant Augustinian uh, of the observant Augustinian order. Um, by that time. And so Luther got introduced to August, Augustinianism through that movement. And the two martyrs that we're going to end up talking about uh, were also uh, observant Augustinian monks. Um, and so that that was sort of the touch point for Luther, um, knowing about the monasteries that they were a part of, um, and knowing at least a little bit about the monks themselves. And if I recall cor correctly from reading other histories and such that uh, these orders kind of, not that there was a, maybe, maybe there was a time, some rivalry, you know, perhaps against the Dominicans, right? You know, Tetzel was not a Augustinian um, and maybe also a little more uh, support of one, one of their own too. So I, I don't know if that's, if there's a, if you talked about that, if there's a real connection because of Augustinian order, I think there, there is a bit, right? Uh, uh, with the involvement of the reform movement and what was going on in, uh, I guess, the Low Countries at that time, but today's uh, sure. Netherlands yeah, and, and maybe Belgium. A, maybe a couple more things to add that are that are tying to what you're saying. Um, first of all, because of the, that loyalty, you know, which sometimes turned into a rivalry between orders, 
you know, you, you kind of wrap your loyalty around the name of your order. Well, in this case, it's Augustine. And so, you know, that probably led members of that order to read Augustine more than perhaps other church fathers. Um, and of course, uh, Luther himself uh, borrowed heavily from a lot of Augustine's thought and found support for a lot of his thought in the Reformation movement. Um, so there's that connection. And then maybe the other thing I should mention is that initially, um, when Johann Staupitz took over as vicar general of the observant Augustinians, um, there were only two districts of the observant Augustinians. There was the district of, uh, or the province, if you will. There was a province of um, Saxony Thuringia, and there was the province of Upper Germany. Um, and kind of the growth had stagnated by the time he took over as, as vicar general. And so he was looking for more opportunities to expand the observant movement. And one of the fertile grounds that he found for doing so was in lower, what was called lower Germany or the low countries. Um, and, uh, and so that was how a number of monasteries uh, from that area, which ends up being the area we we're going to focus on here for these martyrs who came from the low countries, uh, what we today know as uh, Netherlands and Belgium. Um, and I think there's one other. Oh, uh, uh, Luxembourg gets tied in sometimes. Yeah, Luxembourg is part of that. And I think there is well, even parts of France, too. Yeah. Um, parts of France are part of that as well. So, um, so yeah, he ended up uh, expanding his influence into there and sort of converting a couple of Augustinian monasteries uh, that were already conventuals into observant Augustinian monasteries. Um, and then also from one of those monasteries, they end up founding a new monastery in the city of Antwerp, um, which is where this story sort of begins as far as the martyrs are concerned, because that's the that's the monastery to which they belong. So you just explained, just so, so our audience is clear, you're just talking now about the reform movement that's not the Reformation. This is just uh, follow the rules and, and be be more pious, sincere Christians. If you're going to go into this order, you should, you know, abide by by the order. Uh, how does the capital R Reformation now trickle into this the same area? So, in a couple ways, I think first of all, the people and Martin Luther is an example of this. The people who end up being interested in the Reformed Augustinian movement or the observant Augustinian movement. Um, are people who are going to have more sensitive consciences. Um, they're going to care about, more about uh, the written word, whether it's the written word in the rule of the order or uh, the written word of the Bible, uh, whatever the case might be. These are people who, who take stuff seriously. Um, and obviously a big part of the Reformation was Luther's sensitive conscience and taking stuff seriously that God said in his word. Um, so there's there's that connection between the Reformed Augustinian movement and the Reformation of the Christian Church. Um, but then also, precisely because the Reformation gets underway from Martin Luther, who's a Reformed Augustinian or observant Augustinian, he ends up being appointed the district vicar for Saxony Thuringia in um, uh, 1515, um, and is the district vicar from 1515 until 1518. Um, and it's in that capacity as district victor, vicar that he convinces uh, his superior, Johann Staupitz, the vicar general, um, to present some theses at their chapter meeting, what we might call the, we might maybe put it in modern terms, the observant Augustinian conference or district convention. Um, he persuades Johann Staupitz to that he could pre, he could present some of his theses on his new Reformation ideas at their chapter meeting or district convention, if you will, in the city of Heidelberg in 1518. And Staupitz agrees to this, and Luther presents his Heidelberg theses there. Um, and this made a big impact on all of the observant Augustinians who who attended that meeting. They they not only admired Luther's serious theological approach, but also his serious grappling um, with biblical truths and how he ended up finding peace, which ultimately, if you're joining this observant movement, I mean, because of the theology of monasticism to begin with, um, and then if you're joining observant monasticism, that's ultimately what many of these monks are looking for. They want to know that they're right with God, um, and they want to have the certainty that they're going to end up in heaven. Um, and so they they could appreciate um, Luther's struggle for finding this peace of conscience and could see clearly that he found it in the gospel and not in any of these 
this following of rules, whether it's God's rules or man-made rules or or anything else. Not that Luther was against following God's rules by any means, but that that wasn't where his peace came from. Um, that his peace came from the gospel. Um, so the Heidelberg theses definitely played a key role in taking the big R Reformation and injecting it in large part into the Reformed Augustinian movement or observant Augustinian movement. Yeah, thanks for the ex explanation. I'm taking a, a Reformed Reformation course now as far as my studies, and it's interesting how Martin Bucer was at that the Heidelberg disputation. Others were there too. That was kind of a major, we need to go back in time and do a 500 and fifth <laughs> anniversary of that event maybe because that that's pretty key to the reformation just as far as the networking and the spread of the message but you're tying um this uh low countries reformation back back to that as well yeah very very interesting so now moving forward but still backward from the 500 year mark of 1523 the edict of of worms or worms if you want to pronounce it that way uh, that was episode 30 on the Lutheran History Podcast, so we're not going to rehash the whole thing. But I think its impact needs to be revisited again before we get into this, or else we can't uh, understand why uh, Lutherans were burned in Brussels. Now, Luther, we, we heard his story. Uh, he made it away safe, and I think sometimes that leads your casual uh, Lutheran history-minded people to think, oh, the Edict of Worms wasn't that bad. Luther didn't die, so uh, nothing nothing to fear. Well, he was in Saxony with a, a Lutheran, or at least a sympathetic prince, the powerful prince protecting him. How was the Edict of Worms enforced in other places, especially the Low Countries, uh, ruled mm -hmm. by a different family of people? So Charles V, um, who was Holy Roman Emperor, and that's the title we usually focus on, but he had a lot more titles than just Holy Roman Emperor. Um, and one of his titles was Lord of the Netherlands. Um, and sort of his deputy, when he wasn't able to focus on uh, ruling his territory of the Netherlands, um, was Margaret of Austria, uh, who was governor of the Low Countries. Um, and both of them, both Charles V and Margaret of Austria, very staunch Roman Catholics um, and very loyal to the Roman Catholic Church. And so even though... Uh, the Edict of Worms wasn't able, in large part, historians kind of consider it to be a, a impotent document um, because how little it was able to, it ended up being enforced. But if there was one place where it was able to be enforced and was enforced in large part, it was in the Low Countries where Charles V had more control over that territory himself. Um, and he appointed uh, one guy in particular uh, who had received a judicial training in a Roman Catholic university, the University of Louvain, um, Francis van der Hulst. Uh, he appointed him to sort of be a state inquisitor. Um, so secular, but still dealing with religious matters. And eventually the following year, uh, Francis van der Hulst also ended up being confirmed by a pope who came from the Low Countries, Adrian, Pope Adrian, um, as the uh, as an official uh, papal inquisitor as well in that area so he ended up having um inquisition authority from both church and state um francis van der Holsted, and he ends up playing a role in a number of inquisitions um run in that area and so yes there were there were people there were many people in the low countries who were imprisoned for even just being suspected of having lutheran sensibilities um, and Lutheran was kind of a broad category. If you wrote anything that was against the Roman Catholic Church, you were suspected of being a Lutheran, whether you were truly Lutheran or not. Um, so, yeah, it, it was definitely a case where the Edict of Worms was able to be enforced much more and was enforced much more uh, in the Low Countries than it was elsewhere. Yeah, and, and the, the term Low Countries is kind of a, a more recent term. It was all part of the Holy Roman Empire, as loose as a confederation as that was or empire, I guess is what it's called. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the direct rule of uh, Charles V being on multiple levels. He was the emperor high above with debatable authority, but he was mm -hmm. that local local ruler. Yeah, those Habsburg areas uh, of his family were under pressure, as you noted. So this is part of your, your story that I found, I don't want to say more interesting, but at least is equally interesting. Here's a guy uh, that you mentioned and you really get into his personal story. He didn't end up getting burned, uh, but can you tell us a bit about Jacob Prost and how he faced this inquisition for 
his Lutheran views. Yeah, so Jacob Probst um, studies in the University of Wittenberg, which was kind of, uh, if, if there was a university for the observant Augustinian mer- uh, movement, it was uh, the University of Wittenberg, um, because Johann von Staupitz, the vicar general, had worked with um, Elector Charles, excuse me, uh, Elector Frederick the Wise to found that university uh, back in the early 1500s. And so oftentimes they would cycle promising young observant Augustinians uh, through the University of Wittenberg so that then they could go back to their their home monasteries and strengthen the observant Augustinian cause back in their monasteries. Um, And Jacob Probst was one young such uh, promising observant Augustinian who studied in Wittenberg in the 1505 to 1507 era. Um, He ends up staying in Wittenberg and ends up becoming... um, the uh, the prior of the Augustinian monastery uh, in Wittenberg from 1515 to 1518, um, the Augustinian monastery that ends up eventually becoming Luther's house. Um, Jacob Probst was the was the prior of that monastery, and then after 1518, he was then transferred back to the Low Countries, but transferred to a newly founded monastery in the city of Antwerp. And I won't go into all the details there. There there was quite a bit of hubbub when that monastery was founded in the city of Antwerp Clash, especially with the Church of Our Lady, which was the main church in the city of Antwerp, because they realized that this was going to be taking away some influence and some money and income uh, from themselves. So they tried founding it in 1513. Didn't uh, had some hiccups, but eventually then got it approved and officially founded in 1514. And so then in 1518, Jacob Probst is sent to be the new prior um, for this monastery. And he brings his love for Luther and his love for Luther's teaching with him um, and is unashamed to associate himself with Luther and with Lutheran teaching, even from the pulpit um, there at the monastery in, um, in the city of Antwerp. And in 15... Uh, 20, let's see, now I'm trying to remember, I believe it's 1520-ish, he comes back to continue his education, um, and then is is still there in 1522, and it seems like he's not just there to continue his education, but in light of everything else going on, like Luther's stand at the Diet of Worms and the Edict of Worms and everything, he realizes that he's going to be in a delicate position when he goes back um, to the monastery of Antwerp in the Low Countries, so he's also getting advice um, about how he should continue preaching and introducing the Reformation movement there. And when he goes back um, in 1522, um, he's much more subdued. He doesn't mention Luther's name at all in his sermons, even though he's still trying to teach Lutheran teaching. Um, And basically, the authorities that were already paying attention to him and keeping their eye on him weren't buying it. Uh, they, They knew, they could tell from the content of his sermons that really nothing had changed. Um, And so Margaret of Austria and Francis van der Halst um, and other Roman Catholic authorities and inquisitors behind the scenes are working together, uh, Jerome Aleander, the papal nuncio, working together behind the scenes and formulating a plan to imprison uh, Jacob Probst uh, and to interrogate him for his Lutheran beliefs. And that finally ends up uh, happening in December of 1522, after Francis van der Halst had already set out once from Brussels to Antwerp uh, to go and bring him back to Brussels, but his horse threw him and dragged him for a large portion of the trip and injured him severely. Um, And later on, Jacob Probst himself compared that to Balaam's donkey rebuking Balaam, uh, basically said that Francis van der Halst's horse tried to rebuke him, and basically God tried to give him this sign that he was undertaking a, a horrible undertaking. Um, but Francis van der Hals basically just went back to Brussels, licked his wounds and recovered. And then once he was feeling good again, he set out and uh, persuaded. I mean, this is essentially undeniable from anyone on both sides, basically used intrigue and, and really downright lies to persuade uh, Jacob Probst to come back with him to the city of Brussels for a fr- for friendly conversation. Um, and then almost immediately upon getting him to Brussels, they imprisoned him. Um, 
And then his his interrogation and inquisition begins. And not only Francis van der Holst is involved, Jacob van Hoogstraten, who is a notorious inquisitor from uh, the University of Cologne, is involved. Uh, a bunch of other professors from the University of Louvain are involved, like Jacob Latimus. Um, and I'm, I'm forgetting some other names off the top of my head. But um, basically, they, they put him through the ringer. They put him through the ringer with threats. They put him through the ringer with one-on-one -on -one conversations, two-on-one -on -one conversations, appearances before the whole Inquisition, um, having people who knew him and were his friends, uh, who nevertheless were ultimately going to stick with the Roman Catholic Church, come and weep and beg and plead him to return to the Roman Catholic fold and to stop holding on to this Lutheran heresy and to telling him that they wouldn't tell you to turn away from it if um, if it wasn't bad for you. You know, these people were raised in the world of theology. You weren't. They they ultimately must know better. Um, intercepting his letters and then kind of waving them in front of him while he's on trial and saying, you're not supposed to be getting letters, private letters, and, and making him feel foolish and shameful. And Jacob Probst, uh, by his own admission, says basically as soon as they started threatening him with being burned at the stake, he said he, he kind of started having nightmares. Um, and that was an effective tool for him at that at that time. And, and he himself admitted that he wasn't really strong enough to take all of these threats and all of this pressure at the time. Um, so he ends up caving and uh, issuing a public recantation. Um, he ends up caving for good in, in January of 1523 and issuing a public recantation, if I'm not mistaken, in fe February of 1523 at St. Gadulla's Church in Brussels. Um, and they kind of uh, greased the skids for that by threatening the citizens of Brussels with fines if they didn't show up to church that Sunday. They wanted as many people as possible to hear Jacob Probst's recantation. Um, and he tried kind of giving a sermon, kind of a, a tactful, uh, underhanded sermon um, to to indicate that he didn't really mean what he was going to say uh, before he actually publicly read the recantation. But they kind of realized that he was going off script. So they interrupted his sermon and kind of shoved the, in, the recantation in his hands and said, OK, it's time to read this. Um, and so he did. He He read it publicly and he later and probably even at the time experienced a lot of shame and guilt over this. Um, he then ends up back in his hometown of Ypres, uh, all these weird kind of French names in this area. Uh, this is Y-P-R-E-S, and I believe it's pronounced Ypres, uh, which was his hometown, and slowly tries to start preaching the gospel again, again, without associating publicly with Luther. Um, but people realize what's going on, and he starts getting in trouble with local orders, um, ends up in prison a second time back in the city of Bruges, then gets taken back to the city of Brussels, and probably would have ended up being either imprisoned for life or burned at the stake there, except that there were some friends who were Lutheran who advised him that he probably wasn't going to have as much of an impact for the gospel, um, suffering suffering for this second imprisonment as he would have had an impact if he had remained firm at his first imprisonment. And so he actually has some help from a brother monk and some others. He doesn't go into the details, obviously, because he doesn't want to ruin it for other people who might escape in the future. But basically, he escapes from prison and flees to Wittenberg um, and then ends up preaching the gospel much more fearlessly um, from then on. He ends up becoming a, a pastor elsewhere and preaching the gospel much more fearlessly from then on. But yeah, it's his whole case really makes you ask yourself, uh, and, and, oh, and I should also say he writes an, a letter of encouragement to, to his brothers in the Low Countries once he gets back from Wittenberg, in which he apologizes for his behavior and his conduct and encourages them not to follow his, his example, but to follow the scriptures. And he points out all the, all the other people in scripture who fell, even though they were supposedly strong Christians and in positions of, of authority and power. Um, and he says, I'm not saying this to excuse myself, but just to show you that this is a difficult thing um, uh, to consistently stand up for your faith. And I want you to learn from my example so that you guys do what I didn't do. Um, and he does a good job of repeating what the truths of the gospel are in that letter as well. So it's it's really a beautiful and fascinating letter. Um, but anyway, what I was going to say is it really makes you wonder when you read his case, you know, if, if this guy who knew the gospel, well, all you have to do is read his writings. This guy knew the gospel very well. Uh, but he caved. He caved under pressure. And it does make you ask, what would I do?
um, if I was in his shoes and if I was in that situation and I had all of these different pressures and different methods of interrogation being used against me, um, would I be one who, who would ultimately be willing to go to the fire? And it may be that his encouraging letter after he escaped from his second imprisonment, it's entirely possible given the underground, you know, book book selling stuff that was going on and book distributing market that was going on, that perhaps the two monks that we're going to end up focusing on who were willing to be burned at the stake, they may have read that letter uh, before they were imprisoned. And that may have been part of what encouraged them to take this all the way to the point of death. So Jacob, Jacob Probst, even though um, he, he failed by his own admission in many ways, um, ended up ultimately having a very healthy, um, healthy and emboldening influence on the Lutheran church in its early history. Yeah, and he, he certainly did suffer at the hands of the Inquisition, right? Uh, getting nightmares out of it and the manipulation, of, you know, the, the psychological side that maybe hasn't been been part of our uh, overall view of, of, of history that's come out the last hundred years or so, that that whole aspect. And he talks uh, about how you know, he was... He was questioning the doctrine of inspiration, uh, sorry, not the doctrine of inspiration, the doctrine of predestination. If God really predestined me from eternity, would he be letting me undergo all of these pressures and things like that? So, yeah. And they knew, you know, combine all of their methods along with plenty of time, just leaving him alone by himself with his own thoughts. Um, and all of that, all of that did work uh, from an outward point of view, worked very powerfully against him. And, you know, this only, I would say, heightens the importance of of Luther himself. You know, he had his own interrogations, uh, at least the pressure he was under at multiple times um, before he made his kind of here I stand, um, or if he said that or not, right? <laughs> the, uh, the the Diet of Worms stand, at least in a figurative sense, for uh, for his faith. What if he had been like Jacob Prost, a, a good godly preacher of the truth, yet caved under human weaknesses and, and pressures. Uh, things probably would have looked different, I would I would guess. But um, this Jacob Prost story, though, really sets the stage for what's about to happen next. It, he was the, the nearly burned uh, Lutheran of, of Brussels, but uh, we do unfortunately have two more guys to get through. And that's really um, the focus of the main part of our, our topic for today. So Maybe that, one more humorous sure, side note that I forgot to mention is that uh, Luther's nickname for Jacob Probst, because he and he and Jacob Probst got along well in Wittenberg and remained lifelong friends. Uh, Luther's nickname for him was the Fat Little Phlegm. Um, so kind of gives you a, an impression of what what Jacob Probst maybe looked like. I kind of imagine um, I kind of imagine a Friar Tuck type character from Robin mm -hmm. Hood um, for for Jacob Probst. But uh, yeah, so he. He was not this, uh, you know, dashing, handsome man. He was the fat little phlegm, but uh, but ends up, like I said, li this little man ends up having a, a good influence. And like you said, God gave Luther as sort of the, the forerunner of this and gave him particular courage and boldness um, for whatever reasons in his wisdom. Didn't give Jacob Propes the same boldness, but yet nevertheless put him at the right place at the right time, too, to have a, a good and emboldening influence in the end um on his lutheran brothers especially in the low countries as well right and his story you know on the flip side okay we can be inspired to boldness and, and courage like like luther but also the jacob pro story is a story of grace and mercy and redemption too not from the right. position but from from god right so that's there's still still wonderful value there and but by phlegm i should we should probably explain that's not a, a p-h-l-e-g-m yep. phlegm that's a yep. uh you're a Fleming, right? You're from Flanders, which is yep. that part native of the low, low country. A native at the time, it was the Countship of Flanders, uh, which was one of the one of the Countships in the Low Countries. So yeah, he, a Flem is a native of Flanders, and that's where the city of Ypres, where um, Jacob Probst was from, was located in the Countship of Flanders. Yeah, just just so people don't think Luther was being adding right. insult to injury there. <laughs> Well, well, I guess he already like, was somewhat basically insulting. calling him a little loogie or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I don't know if fat was always bad back then, right? If you uh, survived a, a a famine, maybe it was good to be fat. I don't know. Anyway, right. <laughs> yeah. uh, just just thought I should clarify at least part of that. So, okay, well, let's let's now please get into uh, the stories of these two monks, these Augustinians, uh, Heinrich Vos and Jan van der Eschen. I I went through Duolingo Dutch 
couple months ago. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, though. So it's a uh, low German uh, kind of Dutch names, but that, that's a whole other point. They probably would have understood German a little, at least dialects of German better back then because uh, the language didn't, didn't quite solidify until, well, honestly, Luther's Bible translation. Right. So yeah. anyways, please tell us about these two men, what we do know, uh, what limits there might be to knowing about their background. Yeah. So keep in mind, a lot of the details I'm about to share can't be verified with 100% certainty. And that's that's actually something that Luther saw as part of the miracle of their martyrdom is that God took two relatively unknown and insignificant guys and made them the first martyrs in the cause of the gospel in this period of the Reformation. Um you know, they, it, it definitely wasn't because of any sort of prominence or special gifts or notoriety that they had uh, gained before this happened, uh, that God chose them. Um, but near as we can figure out from the evidence that we have, and at least uh, looking at what the majority of the evidence suggests, um, it seems that uh, Jan van den Eschen um, was probably uh, 29 uh, or thereabouts by 1523, when he finally ends up being burned at the stake. Um, he was also, uh, or he was probably from the city of Essen, which is today in Belgium, in a region called the Campine region, which is kind of a, a flat, uh, low farming country, um, uh, which is probably where he gets the last part of his name, Jan van den Eschen. Um, he was one of the founding members of the Antwerp Monastery. Uh, when they had that hullabaloo back when the monastery was being founded and finally then uh, got an agreement signed in 1514 for the monastery's existence to be ensured, he was one of the, the founding members who signed that uh, that document. Uh, so he was there in Antwerp from the beginning, but we don't really know where he came from or what caused him to join the monastery or anything like that. Um, Hendrik Vos or Vase or whatever, however you pronounce his last name, we'll, we'll say Hendrik Vos since that's the first pronunciation you gave. Uh, Hendrik Vos seems to have been from Sertogenbosch. Uh, again, I, I believe that's how it's pronounced. It's a it's a very long city name, usually just called Danebosch uh, for short. Um, it literally means the Duke's Forest or the Duke's Woods. Um, but he was from Sertogenbosch. Um, and seems to have been the younger of the two, was probably 24 um, when he was ultimately burned at the stake in 1523. Um, but he seems to have been the more well-spoken, very articulate man, actually a very uh, handsome young man from one eyewitness account that we, um, that we have. Um, what else do we know about him? Not, not a whole lot. We don't know when exactly he joined the monastery. It does seem that he he and Jan were already close companions and even traveling together. There's a, there's a indication that he may, they may have traveled, um, through the monastery, the reformed, uh, or excuse me, the Augustinian monastery in Eisenach. At some point they had traveled there together, whether they were on business to go somewhere else and just passing through and staying there overnight or whatever the case might've been. So it seems that they were already friends and were close at least a few years before, uh, they ultimately ended up getting burned at the stake. Um, so what happened is that in the summer of 1522, um, they finally, Margaret of Austria and these inquisitors and everyone else finally decided to act decisively um, against uh, the Antwerp Monastery, since they realized there were a lot of Lutheran influences in that monastery. So uh, three, three officials... Um, I'm trying to remember. I remember one of them is called Hieronymus von der Newt, uh, the chancellor. He was the chancellor of Brabant, um, and then a nobleman, and then a notary public uh, showed up on the monastery's doorstep in, I believe it was uh, July of 1522. And they basically say, we've heard that there's Lutheran, a bunch of Lutheran elements in here, and we want to purge purge this monastery of those elements. Uh, so they interrogated the monks, they put a number of them under arrest, transported them to the castle of Phil Philforda. Uh, Philforda is near Brussels, uh, where they were interrogated further then by the, the professors from the University of Louvain. Most of them ended up recanting and returning to the monastery not long thereafter. Uh, they publicly recanted um, in Antwerp. And, but two of them didn't, and that was Jan and Hendrik. Not long after they returned, 
another man by the name of uh, Hendrik von Zitfen um, is sent from Wittenberg uh, to encourage these bro- these persecuted brothers in the Low Countries. He ends up becoming the new prior of the monastery, and he kind of keeps low at first, but then some indulgences start to be uh, offered publicly for sale in the city of Antwerp, so he starts publicly preaching against the indulgences. He ends up getting arrested and held in, you mentioned the rivalries before, he ends up getting held in another monastery belonging to a different order. I'm not remembering which one off the top of my head, um, but ends up getting held in in St. Michael's, uh, Michael's Abbey um, in town, which belonged to a different order. And here's where it gets very interesting. According to one account, there were 300. According to another account, 500. And according to Hendrik von Zipfen himself, there were thousands. But it was predominantly women um, who were sympathetic and loved listening to these Lutheran preachers from this monastery, sympathetic to the Lutheran cause. They show up and basically batter the door down um, and go in and find Hendrik von Zetfin and set him free and bring him back to his monastery in town um, and sort of dust off their hands and our, our, our work is done here and they go they go back home and um, Hendrik von Zitfen stays with them kind of in secret for a few days, and then he flees the territory for good. And a week after he flees the territory for good, uh, Margaret of Austria basically sends her henchmen in and says, we're closing down this monastery for good, and you're all under arrest because they can tell that Lutheranism has not been squashed there at all. Um, So most of those then get sent back to the castle at Filforta. Others get placed elsewhere, but most of them go back to the castle of Filforta. Um, are interrogated over a period of a number of months. They end up, most of them end up getting released by early 1523, except for one named Lambert de Thorin, or Torin, however you want to pronounce it. We'll call him Lambert Thorn uh, for the sake of ease. Lambert Thorn ends up getting put with the other two, uh, Hendrik Voss, uh, Hendrik Vos, and, and Jan van den Eschen. Um, and they're the three that are stubborn. They're the three that will not recant. And so, um, in June of that year is when Francis van der Hulst gets his official appointment as a papal inquisitor and basically puts the pieces into motion whereby these three monks are going to be burned at the stake uh, in Brussels. They do not announce it publicly beforehand, so it basically is word of mouth that spreads just in the city of Brussels on the morning of July 1st. And whoever happens to be in the city at the time, whether citizen or visitor, um, they're the ones who find out about it by word of mouth. So there's this rush into the market square on that morning. And first there's this uh, stage that is set up uh, in in the market square, in the main market square, right in front of the city hall um, with a makeshift altar that's set up on it as well. And first Hendrik Vos uh, is brought out and is basically uh, defrocked. He goes through a, a rite called degradation, uh, whereby basically all of the, the orders that he's taken on uh, that have been conferred on him um, or ordinations or whatever are taken away one by one. And there's someone who's preaching from uh, from behind the altar while this is going on. And then there's a, um, a bishop's assistant, auxiliary bishop, who actually performs the rite of degradation in front of the altar with Hendrik Vos. Um, the long and short of it is basically they end up putting a, a wafer and a chalice in his hand uh, and then end up taking them away as part of the rite to show that he's no longer able to distribute the sacrament. They slice his his fingers with a uh, glass shard so that he can no longer, to indicate he's no longer able to give the Trinitarian blessing. Um, and then they clothe him, they, they take disrobe him and clothe him in a yellow robe to represent treason and send him send him away. Then they bring the other two out, Jan van den Eschen and Lambert Thorne, and they do the same thing to them, only they clothe them in black. I don't know if they ran out of yellow robes or what, but clothe them in black and send them away. Um, and it's at that point, this is the in-between period between the actual rite of degradation and the actual burning at the stake, Lambert Thorne caves. Um, and he 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 smells what's coming, and he's not willing to go through with it at this time. And so he asks for a few days reprieve to think the matter over. Uh, long and short of his story is he ends his sentence ends up being commuted to life in prison. Um, 
And even though he does get some sort of secret Lutheran visitors from the low countries who sustain him with encouragement and with um, various uh, food and drink and things like that, he ends up uh, dying after kind of a sad existence for a number of years. Luther does write him a letter of encouragement at one point, which we don't know if it ever got into his hands or not, but he ends up dying in prison in 1528, so quite a number of years later. Um, but back to 1523, July 1st, 1523 in Brussels, um, the other two stand fast. Uh, four monks accompany them out to the fire, father confessors who try to persuade them to recant one last time. And then even once they get tied up to the stake, um, tied up to their stakes in the fire, uh, they don't set the fire right away for a good half hour to basically just try to intimidate them some more into recanting. But the whole time they stand very firm and they say, basically, you, you know, we aren't the ones who need to recant. We're, you're the ones who need to repent of this great injustice that you're doing. So they finally light the fire. And uh, basically up until the smoke chokes out their lungs and, and the heat of the fire prevents them from from doing from doing this anymore, they're basically engaged in acts of encouragement and prayer and worship. And the two things that we know, three things that we know that they uh, said repeatedly, either on their own or alternating with each other, were the Apostles' Creed, the song from what we call morning prayer or morning praise, uh, we praise you, O God, we acclaim you as Lord, the Te Deum Laudamus, as it was called in old times. Um, they sang that song or or said that song, either sang or recited it. And um, one of them in particular kept on saying, uh, oh, Christ, son of David, have mercy on us or, or have mercy on me. Um, and one of them were told in particular, basically, the flames burned his ropes off and he fell down to his knees in the fire. And he cried out, oh, Christ, son of David, have mercy on me, one, uh, have mercy on us one more time. Um, and that was basically his last words. Um, and eventually they they passed away to glory. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe someone in their eyewitness account said that the total event from the rite of degradation up until the burning was done uh, was something like four hours um, that it took on July 1st. So uh, really remarkable. You do get the impression sometimes with these old stories, two of the old martyrs in the first few centuries, you, you hear these legends uh, about things that they said, like St. Lawrence is my favorite one that I've heard where he is actually roasted on a grill and he supposedly says, you can turn me over, I'm done on this side, uh, according to one tradition or according to another tradition, I'm done, you may eat now if you like. Um, and you wonder, you know, how many of these things are true, but you do get the impression that God gives these people, and even from the Bible's accounts of martyrs, that God gives these people some sort of supernatural resolve to be able to undergo what they're going uh, what they're undergoing. And it seems like that certainly was the case with these two, not that they didn't experience any pain necessarily, but that they were able to share biblical words of encouragement with each other right up until the end. It's really quite fascinating. Yeah, it's not much more to, to say than that, that that was, uh, there's more, <laughs> maybe you could read in your article, but it was a, a very, very thorough, uh, uh, discussion of that. I guess I'm kind of at a loss for words to, to, to ask or add, a, add anything else uh, other than, I guess, to uh, move on a little bit and say, ask what are some of the reactions to this, the martyrdom of these two young men? Yeah. So I'll try to, I'll try to keep this short. I know it's already going long. I, I'm not a good, I'm not a good person for summary, but Luther cries when he first hears the news. He, he says, I, I thought I was going to be the first to be martyred for the sake of this holy gospel, but I apparently wasn't worthy of it. Um, but he then ends up writing a number of letters uh, to his friends and then even to the people in the low country, an open letter to the people in the low countries themselves in which he gives praise and thanks to God that he's now um, confirmed his gospel with martyrdom and with and with blood, so to speak, and with loss of life, which is one of the marks of people who adhere to the truth. Jesus said that this would happen to his followers. So this is just further confirmation for Luther that he's on the side, excuse me, that he's on the side of the truth. Um, he also ends up writing his first hymn, which is actually kind of more of a ballad than it is a hymn. Um, I think initially, I'm trying to remember if it initially had 12 verses and then was augmented to 14 or if it was 10 and then augmented to 12, but it was a lot of verses um, in which he basically retold the story 
um, of these martyrs. You can find some books in which uh, the hymn is published. Uh, most notably, Concordia Publishing House has a book called The Hymns of Martin Luther, in which it's uh, a translation of it into English is set to its original tune. And it's once you learn it, it's singable. Um, it's not necessarily a tune you catch up first time, th- catch on to first time through, but it's singable. Um, and it's a beautiful hymn and a beautiful tribute to those martyrs and a beautiful tribute to God uh, for the resolve that he gave them and to, to his truth, the truth of his gospel. Um, among the Roman Catholics, there was kind of a twofold reaction. Um, Erasmus wasn't sure whether he should be happy or sad that these guys, you know, he wasn't really sure if they were true believers or not, because Erasmus ultimately did remain a loyal Roman Catholic. Um, but he did say that they did, it was undeniable that they died. They exhibited unbelievable steadfastness and died with amazing boldness and perseverance, Um, He also criticized the Roman Catholics for even taking it to that measure, because he says, as soon as you burn these people at the stake, you only draw attention to the to the message that they were proclaiming. And he didn't like the fact that Roman Catholic authorities, some Roman Catholic authorities that were involved in the burning at the stake were claiming that they recanted at the last moment. Um, And he said, this is a common thing that you find you know, that that our church likes to claim whenever people are actually steadfast in the fire, then they claim that they recanted at the last moment. And he said, even the executioner will deny this. Um, he said, this is just a bunch of hocus pocus and a bunch of lies. So he was critical. Um, but there were others uh, like George Hauer in the city of Ingolstadt, who used the event for a number of sermons on um, festivals having to do with Mary. Um, where he made fun of them and said they got what they deserved. Um, and that, you know, these stories about them being unbelievably steadfast and supposedly having special special strength in the fire, he said, those are just lies. They perished miserably, and that's the way that they should have perished um, because they were holding on to these lies. Um, and then there were, uh, it was largely successful at stifling Lutheranism in the Low Countries and especially in the city of Antwerp. But there were some secret Lutherans that met secret, continued to meet secretly in the city of Antwerp, um, and they ended up being put on trials of various sorts with city officials in the years that followed. Um, and and many of the people in these circles and in these conventicles, as they were called, uh, indicated that basically they were first turned on to Lutheranism by these martyrs, by watching, by being eyewitnesses to this martyrdom and and realizing these people were willing to die for this so steadfastly and beautifully. Um, Maybe there's something to this message that I should be checking out more. Um, I don't, that's an area of research. You always ask, like, are there any, er, any areas of research that you would like to pursue? That would be a great area of research to pursue is what happened uh, what happened to that circle. Um, I believe the name of the guy who was kind of at the head of the circle was, uh, Kles, which is sort for Nicholas, Kles von der Elst, um, the Kles von der Elst circle. Um, and it would be, I would be interested to know, were they allowed to continue meeting secretly? Did they get put in prison? What happened to them? I don't know a lot about it other than that they existed. Um, so yeah, and, and they emboldened, they emboldened uh, other people to die for the faith in the future. Hendrik von Zitfen, um, even though he escaped initially in 1523, he ended up being put to death by a by a mob action in 1524 for holding to Lutherans to hold from holding to the Lutheran truth. Um, uh, there was a guy not too long after that, uh, George George Rayer, uh, no, not not George Rayer, excuse me, George Scherer, George Scherer, who was beheaded in uh, the Archbishopric of Archbishopric of Salzburg, which is today Austria. Uh, he was beheaded in Rot- the city of Rotstadt for his preaching of Lutheranism um, in that territory. And then one of the other uh, monks uh, from that same monastery, Antwerp, um, named Adrian or Hadrian, uh, ended up being put to death in the 1530s um, for his faith as well. So they they started, they, they sort of blazed the path, so to speak, for others to be willing to die for uh, for the Lutheran faith and for the sake of the gospel in the in the years to come. So certainly, uh, well, most certainly the the first, but not not the last, uh, at least to bear the, the Lutheran name to die for their faith. Right. So that that brings us to our um, final final thought here uh, for our time today. What can Lutherans take away from this historical event? And I, I guess they can go to extension. Any any faithful you know Bible believing Christian too can get something out of this too for right. sure. Absolutely. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I guess what what I take away from it is twofold, predominantly. What what an easy life we currently live, in spite of the way we see the country t- trending, and you know who knows in however many more years, someone, uh, cr- Christians in this country may be called to, to give up their lives or at least to to suffer imprisonment for the sake of the faith. That that very well may be coming, but it's not here yet. Don't take, don't take the freedom that you have for granted, um, especially religious freedom. Um, go to church, uh, listen to the gospel, uh, make use of God's word and grace while you have it, to use Luther's own expression from a later writing. Um, what a wonderful thing freedom, freedom is where we don't have to fear being imprisoned, being interrogated, being put before an inquisition and ultimately being burned to death, uh, while tied to a stake. Um, what a wonderful blessing that is that we should not take for granted. And then the second thing is the gospel that we preach and that we believe is worth dying for. Um, whether we would do it or not, whether we would be willing to do it or not, and would ultimately, you know, go to the fire or not for the gospel, of course, probably none of us knows until we might actually get put in that position. Um, but we can say theologically, it is worth dying for. Um, and we should be willing, at least in theory, to die for it. Um, Jesus himself said that that was the case. Uh, Jesus gave up his life for us. And in return, he doesn't call on a lot of us to do it. But for those he does call upon to do it, they should be willing to give up their lives for him. Um, and of course, we're the only thing that can strengthen us to do that is the the very gospel of the forgiveness of sins and the sure hope of eternal life that we preach. And that's also what gives us um, hope beyond whatever miserable deaths we might suffer in this life. Um, for whatever reason, we know that we have an eternity in heaven waiting for us and, and a glorious eternity in heaven waiting for us on the other side that will make all of our earthly miseries look like a drop in the ocean by comparison. Um, So thank God for these two men, Jan and Hendrik, uh, for the example that they've set for us and for for reminding us what's really and ultimately important in this life. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor Bieber, for sharing your research with us again. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on again.